Welcome to the Geek to Geek Podcast, where we switch it up. I'm Void, and I'm here with my co-host, Beige. I don't switch anything. We're not actually switching things up. We're just no. talking about the Nintendo Switch. Um, So, it revealed... Like everybody else in the world right now. Yeah. It got revealed last week. It came, Like, the day that our episode came out, it was revealed. So, we're a little bit, like, a week behind, but we're super excited about it, and we had another episode planned, and then we were like, no, we want to talk about the new Nintendo console. Yeah, so, we have to, because we've been talking back and forth about the NX for months, and what we hoped it was, every little snippet of, of information that we could get. So, once we actually had, it's like, yeah, we're talking about this. Yes. So this is our episode. We push the other one back to next week, but that'll be fine. Basically, it's everything that we wanted it to be and everything that speculation said it would be plus more is kind of my takeaway overall. Yeah, that's kind of the way it is for me. It's perfect for me. That's good. Yeah, I don't I'm I'm really optimistic about this one. And so if you haven't seen the reveal, if you haven't been on the Internet in the last week and a half, um, It's basically a handheld system and a home console built in one. They say that it's a home console first, but you can take it with you on the go. So it has like, um, just trying to describe it with words really quick. You should probably just go watch the video because it's like a three minute video and it shows you all the things it can do. But basically, um, think of the size of like a tablet screen, like probably a little bit bigger than an iPad mini, but not as big as an iPad, right? Right. Um, That's the, the guts of the console. That's the brains of the console. You have two attachable controllers that click onto the sides of it. So you have real buttons. And then when you get home, what you can do is you can put the tablet part into the console. You can take those two little controllers off the sides. It acts as a charging station and it also acts as a dock for your tv so it'll hook in via hdmi and then you have a bunch of controller options basically you can take those two little controller handles from the sides and you can put them onto it looked like a a little controller thing you can just slide them into that acts as almost a pro controller or you can just buy pro controllers also they showed off some of those so that's that's the basic idea of the nintendo switch is that it's a home console that you can take with you on the go and from what I gather, like they're not saying that this is a successor to 3DS or Wii U. It's its own thing. But this might be the single product line going forward. They might be yeah. done doing console and like home console and handheld separate. They might just put all of their development resources into this, which is what I hope happens. Because if we had all of the teams internally at Nintendo who are making 3DS games and Wii U games, if they can all put them onto one system now, that means we basically get twice the amount of games from Nintendo that we did last generation it's not only that we get twice the amount of games but we're also less investment in it where we don't have to buy two consoles where we just buy the switch where we're not having to buy the 3ds and the wii u or something like that and peripherals and cases and things like that for both of them we just invest in one and get more return on that investment yes exactly so a couple other things about it it is cartridge based so um it looked more like like a game card that you would click into like a 3ds or like a vita just like a little game card that you can plug in um i'm all digital these days so that probably won't matter for me i hope it has a huge internal hard drive but we'll talk about that later um it has a 3.5 millimeter headphone port so it has a leg up on the iphone 7 already (laughs) um it oh man i can't believe they took that port out of that phone i know i'm still mad about it yeah, but so it, it has a normal headphone port, which is great. It has a really nice big HD looking screen on it. Like they haven't released the specs, but it looked nice in the video. So hopefully it's a good HD console, you know, finally, instead of their low resolution 3DS and the low resolution DS before it. Um, yep. It looks like they're finally getting up to modern standards, which is really good. And then there's like there's a kickstand on the main screen, which I thought was interesting. You can just yeah, kick that's it back interesting to see. and set it up on the go. But I guess the main thing probably to talk about first are the detachable controllers, because that's kind of... Yeah. That's some of the core functionality in the different ways you can use them, right? So they showed off a bunch of different controller configurations. Was there any particular one that jumped out to you as the most interesting or most appealing? Being able to have multiplayer straight out of the box, being able to use the individual halves of the controller is probably what I'm most excited about because that was something that my wife and I, because it's just the two of us, a lot of times we don't want to invest in a second controller because there are fewer games or at least invest in a second controller immediately 
once we've bought the console because that's a big investment for us. That's the way that we've got things budgeted. So when we're paying sixty dollars for an extra controller or a or even you know thirty for a cheaper one for one that's going to end up breaking and feeling wonky, then we seeing that there is a second controller that comes with it and that you can just attach is fantastic for us like that's the kind of thing that i'm excited about we're just kind of hoping that they're comfortable because they really do look small but the video you can't tell you know like we were talking about before that the screen looks a certain size, so maybe the halves of the controllers won't be unbelievably uncomfortable to use as the mini controllers. Yeah, they look tiny, but I see what you're saying. Like, it could be cool to be able to play just on the go um, yeah. with whoever. Like, I could see I could see some cases where I would use this. Um, I don't think I would ever use it a whole lot, but, like, if we're on a trip and my wife and I are out and we had Mario Kart, like, I bet it would yep. be great for Mario Kart. Mario Kart doesn't take very many buttons at all. Um, yeah. They showed off a sports game. It looked like some kind of basketball game. And if you're into sports games, you probably know what it is. And you're yelling at me for not knowing what it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, there was basketballs. Yeah. That's so they showed that off. Me. I mean, I could see that too. Sports games could be cool. Um, anything that's like multiplayer competitive. I mean, it just if it doesn't have a whole lot of buttons, it would be a good fit for those controls. But it's cool that you could just take the system in its portable mode with the controllers clicked into the sides. And then yep. whenever you get where you're going, you flip out the kickstand and then break those two off and just hand one to somebody. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that we end up doing a lot. Like on our honeymoon, we ended up bringing the Wii so that while we locked ourselves in a cabin, we could play Mario Kart. So this is something that our, that our, you know, that tradition can continue and become much easier to deal with. You know, just having the kickstand set it up on a coffee table you know in the middle of the woods and play mario kart without having to really do a lot of setup this is the kind of thing that as an adult i want because it makes it easier for me to do the things i want while you know not taking a huge investment of time like you've talked about the vibe being and things like that yeah i could even see like just winding down for the night um Uh sometimes if my wife and i are like in bed about to go to bed um we'll put like an ipad in the middle of our bed against the headrest the headboard and watch a video or something if there's a series that we're watching together just to like chill out right before we go to bed i can see putting the nintendo switch there and like doing around a mario kart you know something like that awesome so even though it's not like going out and about it's somewhere else in your house which I honestly think that I'm going to get the most use out of it around my house. Like Probably, yeah. Um, just picking it up out of that dock and using it, uh, seeing all the different configurations, I'm pretty sure for me the one that's going to get the most use is the handheld unit detached from the dock with the two controllers clicked into the sides. So it's yes. basically like an awesome Vita that has Nintendo games on it is kind of the takeaway from that configuration for me. Yeah, that, that's pretty much the way I am because I fully expect to have my wife watching something on TV or something like that that I'm half paying attention to, but grabbing the uh, the Switch and I keep wanting to call it the NX, but yeah. grabbing the Switch and just sitting back on the couch playing Breath of the Wild, playing Mario Kart or just jumping around in a Mario game and talking with her or just going back into my office while she's editing on the couch, editing some one of her projects one of her books and then you know i'm not wanting to bother her and i just take my game off into the other room so we can both be comfortable or something like that it's that kind of portability is what really excites me about it well and one of the things um it's not exactly related to the controllers but like the fact that it looked like you could click it into the dock and it's just instantly sending the video signal to the tv and i don't know how much of this is just post-production like you could tell all the screens in this are simulated because it gives you a better look at the screen basically (laughs) yeah um and that's just something they do for video production don't read too much into that like they're probably not trying to pull a fast one on you it's just something you do when you're making a nice looking video that's what happens yeah is so as someone who did video production for a long time i'll tell you like every screen you see on tv is basically simulated that's just the way we do it um but it looked like when you put it in the dock it's just instantly on the tv and when you pull it out of the dock it's instantly on the handheld like there was no delay there was no like pause it or flip modes or go to a menu or anything it looked like you could just do it and i liked that a lot 
Yeah, and that's the kind of thing that makes it useful because this is the kind of this is the kind of functionality that I wanted out of the Wii U. This is something that I was excited about when I first saw the tablet part of it that I was expecting it to be able to play like this. And while it kind of does, it's not comfortable or really you know great to do that with and since this one's designed with that first and foremost i think it will be they learned their lesson with the wii u basically this is the wii u 2.0 where it's like oh yeah this this will work this time guys we promise and now that we see what this is it's like a reverse wii u in a way um, yeah, where the Wii true. U was broadcasting to like the controller, the handheld unit, and this, all the brains are in the handheld unit, and it mm-hmm. just hooks into your TV if you want. So it feels like, n- now that we've seen this, it feels like that Wii U was a necessary step for them to take to get to this, but they didn't quite nail it with the Wii U because now we can right. see what they would have liked to do, you know, which is the Switch, which looks really cool. Like, I can see myself using this so much because... I use my handheld consoles all the time, mm-hmm. and um, it, it takes more effort to wait until the main TV is kind of free at night, you know, wait for all my other stuff to be done, my kids are in bed, um, let's see if my wife's using the main TV for anything, and then to, like, free it up to play a game on it, so, like, what I do right now for the PS4 or the Wii U, whereas this, like, the handheld portion of it, I'm going to use all the time, and then when I go click it into the TV, it's like an added bonus. Yeah. That's really the way it is that I think that most people will use it. Because if you're a Nintendo fan these days, you're pretty much loving the handheld stuff. Like, I don't talk to a lot of Nintendo fans who are just all about the Wii U and the games on it. It's the 3DS stuff that I personally hear about more often. Yeah, and you can tell that they're really trying to sell it as a home console first. I don't know how much of the marketing you looked at, but they're Not a whole lot, actually. They're pushing that super hard. Like, they want you to think of this as a home console that you can take on the go. They do not want people to think of this as a handheld console that you can hook up to your TV. Because Which makes sense. It does. I mean, those are different markets, even though it's the exact same thing in a way. Like, the way you position your product and push it, they're going to push it as this home console. You can play home console games on the go. They're not going to push it as look at this awesome handheld that you can then play on your TV. Like it yeah. just has a different feel to it. And a lot of that may just be marketing as opposed to the way that the console actually works because you know this is all speculation, but from a marketing standpoint, they have to compete with the PS4 and Xbox 1 at this point. This may be Nintendo's last real chance at doing that because we have such a shift in the gaming community and looking at things like Destiny and Halo and Call of Duty and Mad and all of the stuff that are really popular, these blockbuster franchises that people look for year after year after year. And those people are generally not the ones who buy Nintendo consoles. So if since they have such a third party lineup already, they made sure to to tout that they're pushing it as a home console as opposed to a handheld. While they're not necessarily going to be a PS4 killer because that's not going to be possible at this point, they're at least going to be a PS4 peer, whereas the Wii U was something completely different that those gamers didn't even touch because it didn't have the power. And that's one of the main issues I've seen people talking about is that there have been inside reports that I've read about saying that even Breath of the Wild isn't going to be as as pretty on the Switch as it is on, say, the Wii U. And so that that kind of worries me a little bit that those rumors are going around, but I don't know how, how substantiated those are. Well, we don't actually know the specs of it yet. Um, there are some things that leaked out, but who knows what's real. The only yeah. thing that they announced is that it's a, a what's it called? A Tegra chip, which uh-huh. is like a NVIDIA partnership. They're used in, I want to say, tablets and smartphones. But yeah. they said that this is a new custom Tegra chip. So it might be a custom version of the newest line of them, or it might be a custom version of ones that are out there already on the market because those might have come down in price and be cheaper. Yeah. We just don't know until we get more details from Nintendo. And they kind of said that we're not going to get a whole lot of other details this year about games, yeah. but they might clarify some of the hardware stuff before the end of the year. 
Which is going to be fantastic because that's going to push a lot of people, I think, around Black Friday and Christmas to either hold off for the switch, to hold off for the switch, or to go ahead and buy their PS4 if that's the kind of if that's the kind of decision they're having to make. Yeah, it's like there's finally enough info to kind of make your console choices if you haven't already. Um, yeah, I did want to backtrack to the controllers a little bit. I'm probably going to buy a pro controller. I know you probably won't just because you don't like to invest in more controllers yeah. than you need. And you were already talking about how cool the mini ones were. But how do yeah. you feel about that thing? I don't even know what to call it, but it was like the little piece of plastic spacer that had grips on it that you can click the two controllers into when you're sitting at home. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, the, I can't remember that there actually was a name for it that I saw online and I can't remember it now, but I thought it was a neat idea. Because so many gamers are, and I, I can't even say gamers, so many people have way bigger hands than I do. Like, I've got hands that are disproportionately small to my body, and it, it's very strange. Like, I wear a women's small in gloves, Let, and so I'm... I'm six feet tall, so it's it's my hands are tiny. I have, you know, small hands. So when I see a small controller, I don't think anything about it. My hands are probably going to be comfortable on whatever it is. You know, I can still, I can use the old iPhones just fine without worrying about it, where I know some of my friends who have hands three times the size of mine couldn't type on it. And so when I see the spacer in it, I wonder if that's just a comfort thing for people to make sure that they don't have to buy the pro controller if they don't want to to just use that and make sure that it's not you know four inches across yeah i think it's more like that's probably the cheapest way to go about it that's probably the default that they're going to expect you to have when you're at home sitting on your couch and your system is docked like i don't i see that one as the one coming in the box and then if you want to go buy a pro controller it costs you separate money that's extra and i think that would be the smart thing for them to do just in terms of profit and revenue that you give someone a basic enough option where they don't feel as though they're second class citizen that then you can go out and buy the premium and that's a business model that i've always liked i mean i'll a lot of times I can deal with the bare minimum. I play free to play games and I play the free part of it without really ever investing in the game unless it's something super awesome that I love or that I feel like I need or would make my life significantly better. And I guess it's going to be until we play with it and see how the controller actually is and how the buttons feel, whether or not the pro controller will be a, you know, if it's worth spending 60 bucks on. Yeah. And well, one of the other controller things they showed is that you can just click the controllers off and keep them in your hands. Like you don't yeah. have to hook them into any spacer or device. Like they showed a guy on a plane, put the kickstand up, put the screen up, take off the controllers and just sit there. So it was almost like having a Wii remote and a nunchuck without the cable. You know, you can just yeah. kind of sit back and have them casually in each hand, but separate from each other. I don't think I would ever play that way, but it's nice to have more options, I suppose. Okay, see, I liked that because that was my favorite way to play the Wii because when I was playing Mario Kart, I never did the motion controls. I was doing it with the uh, the nunchuck. So I'm used to playing with that, and so I'm used to going through and, and holding it in both hands and just being comfortable on my couch. So I was really excited to see that. I was like, oh, cool, this will be just like the Wii when I do that. Cool. Yeah. And like I said, I, it's not my favorite controller configuration, but I, I'm glad that there's more options for more people. It's always a good thing, especially since it doesn't cost any extra money. It's just yeah. how you choose to click those two controllers into whatever configuration you're going to do. And that goes into what Nintendo does all the time is they're messing with controllers. They're the ones who made the current game controllers that we use. I mean, the default with the trick from the but start select and buttons and D-pad all the way to having trigger buttons. They're the ones who revolutionized that. They're the ones who gave us analog sticks. They're the ones who gave us a secondary uh, series of buttons at the time, the C buttons on the 64 that eventually became the uh, the right analog stick on the PlayStation just to be able to do that. They're the ones who gave us motion controls. They're the ones who did all of this. So for them to give you so many options, I'm really excited that it's a very Nintendo thing to do to experiment with the controller that much. And so to see them say, oh, this is, you can play it any way you want 
is the revolution or the revolutionary part of this as opposed to it just being uh detachable and i wouldn't be surprised if they have like gyroscopes in them either just knowing yeah. nintendo and the last couple systems they've put out i bet that they are in there just because they probably don't cost a lot anymore and True. they've done so much motion controls i i don't like using gyroscopes in my controllers i always disable them if it's an option in a game Uh uh-huh but um just knowing nintendo they're probably there they're probably already built into those controllers those joy con things whatever they're that's what they're calling them joy cons joy cons so the other hardware stuff we kind of mentioned there's the kickstand there's the headphone port um there's cartridge based the thing i want to ask you about how do you feel about the overall size of the form factor because it has a nice big hd screen but this is one of those things where like I think they've finally given up the fact that people don't really carry their 3DS in their pocket, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I take my 3DS with me sometimes, but when I do, it goes into my bag. Like, I close the clamshell, I throw it in my bag. It never goes in my pocket, and maybe they finally just yep. realized people are used to tablets, they're used to all sorts of devices that just go in a bag or in a backpack or whatever, you know? People don't need it to fit in your pocket, so they can finally make it bigger. That's kind of... That's what I thought they were probably thinking, but how do you feel about the form factor? That's what I was thinking in terms of why they made it the size that they did, because they want it to be, you know, an HD screen and it look very nice and it not be small and, and, you know, smushed up where you can see the detail in it. But also, I'm the kind of person who I don't like large handhelds. I have an iPad, the second generation, the iPad 2, and it's too big. I don't like using it because it's uncomfortable and unwieldy for me that I want an iPad had mini or a seven inch like android nexus tablet or one of those and or a kindle fire that kind of thing is the perfect size for me so this one is going to just have to be a i'll see how it works for me because i could see it being a little bit big but i also like the size of the 2ds even though i don't carry it with me the only one that i carry with me is my vita i throw it in my backpack and i go whereas the 2ds anything like that i just don't bring with me but i think you hit the nail on the head when it's they're you know they're looking for people just to throw this in their bags and not their pockets that they're moving away from handhelds and even if kids get this they're used to using ipads they're used to using the larger educational tablets they're used to using things that you know they don't have to have them super small like the gbasp you're looking at a generation who's used to larger handhelds so this is just going to be another you know another iteration for them where people like me are the ones who are like eh, this is a little big i don't know if i want to deal with it but that's just a nitpick i mean i think it's going to have a beautiful screen based on what they were showing so i just we'll see how comfortable it is comfort's a big deal for me so i hope it's comfortable to hold yeah and i think one of the things is that the video they showed is an aspirational video like if you actually think about the scenarios they're presenting most people are never going to use it in those scenarios right no the one that's the most realistic is the guy on the plane because Uh if you are a frequent traveler this is going to be great for you you know you can take it on the plane when you get to wherever your hotel is for the night wherever you're staying you can use it in the hotel and you can actually put it down and take the controller off and hook it up like that one seemed real all of the other ones seemed like we want people to think that this is the way they'll use it like but they're not no but that's realistic you know your friends waving you over to a rooftop party is not gonna happen right like if you take your dog for a walk you're taking your dog for a walk you're not gonna ignore your dog (laughs) like all of these things you know if you're playing a midnight basketball game you're not gonna stop and then get out your like multiple hundred dollar machines and like put them on a picnic table like no these things don't happen in real life right but it's aspirational um the truth is most most of us are going to use these around our house you know the majority of the time and i think that they've realized that which is another reason they don't mind making the screen bigger like you just won't take it with you all that often Yeah, because you're probably not going to have it in your bag you're not going to have to worry about carrying it around anywhere this isn't something like you're going to have out at a conference for work or anything unless it has you know tablet capabilities that we don't know about yet but knowing nintendo they don't do the media center thing they don't do that kind of they they do game consoles well and i think that this ties into their mobile initiative yeah. They are starting to release games on the phone because they know that that's where people play games when they're out and about. 
we don't take Game Boys with us anymore. We don't take mm-hmm. 3DSs and Vitas. I mean, some of us do, but you and I are the exceptions, right? Yeah, we are. Most people don't do that. Most people play games on their phone, though. They play them all the time. So I think we're going to get less mobile games and more console games in general because Nintendo realizes that these handhelds people use, they use them around their house, right? And instead, they're going to give us stuff like Super Mario Run on the iPhone. They're going to give us things like the Fire Emblem and the Animal Crossing that are coming out on the iPhone. Like, they're going to push a bunch of... I I think they're going to split the games that we would have seen on 3DS and the ones that are more like console games, they're going to take them a step further towards console. And the ones that are more like on-the-go mobile games, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to take them and push them a step closer to phone games. And it's going to be more of a division than it used to be. But I think that's okay. Like, I don't think that's a bad decision for them. No, I don't think it is. They Because Nintendo for a long time has tried to do their own thing without looking at the market, it seems like. And it seems like they're now taking the initiative to look at what people want. And like I said, they're trying to revolutionize with controller and doing this because that's what they've done. But they're actually looking at how people play for the first time in a long time. Yes. Um, Okay. So before we get too far into speculation, there were games that we saw. So there's a new 3D Mario game. There's a Mario Kart. There's a basketball game, which some of you out there probably know what company or which game it was, but I don't. It's just a basketball game. I don't have any idea. Um, There was Breath of the Wild. There was Splatoon and there was Skyrim. I think it was Skyrim. It looked like Skyrim. I'm assuming it was Skyrim. It looked like Skyrim. Are any of those more interesting than others to you? I do not care about Splatoon because I've never played the first one. Uh, I've heard it's great and just never played it. Um, The new 3D Mario game I'm going to be all about. The Mario Kart game is the main one I'm excited for because I love me some Mario Kart. And I haven't been able to play Mario Kart 8 because of uh, not having a Wii U basketball game and eh, i don't play sports games that i don't enjoy them i'm glad other people do something i'll never touch and then breath of the wild will absolutely get a lot of my attention like it's gonna get tons of my time and in terms of skyrim i've played skyrim unless i mean i have the legendary edition on pc i don't see myself taking that kind of game with me and or just sitting at home with it anymore i've invested so many hours in it that i'll probably play the hd remaster that they're releasing soon but i don't think i'm gonna do a playthrough. i'm gonna go look at stuff and explore a little bit and then be done with it so i'm glad it's out there for people who haven't had that experience but i won't be playing it yeah skyrim um i'm actually excited for the hd remaster which is out later this week actually but in terms of the games they showed off, the ones I'm excited for are the Nintendo games. Like, that's yeah. why I buy Nintendo consoles. I can get all my other games on better hardware elsewhere for third parties, you know? I buy a lot of games on PC. I buy some on PS4. Depends on what the game is. I buy Nintendo games on Nintendo consoles, which is why I buy Nintendo consoles in the yeah. first place. So the new 3D Mario game is looks awesome. I love Mario platformers. I will always yep. buy them, and I will always have a good time with them. And then the, a new Mario Kart absolutely like i love mario kart it looked like it might be mario kart 9 whatever they end up calling it yeah because it looked a little bit different from mario kart 8 well this kind of gets us into speculation which is fine that's kind of next up on our list i'm thinking that they might take a bunch of wii u games and upport (sighs) them to the switch because the wii u install base never got that big so they have all of these great games that a lot of people like you have never played right Mm -hmm. i've never touched i own them digitally already so in an ideal world, they would upport them and then they would give them to me for free because I already own them digitally and they can verify that. But like the Mario Kart is a good example. Are we seeing Mario Kart 9 or are we seeing an upported version of Mario Kart 8 that's designed for the Switch? And I'd be okay with either of them, honestly, because playing Mario Kart, the upgrades that they tend to do in Mario Kart games, the only one that ever felt truly substantial for me, you know, outside of, you know, Mario Kart 64, because coming from the Super Nintendo, yeah, Mario Kart 64 was a huge leap forward. But in terms of the recent ones, the only one that ever felt truly different and fantastic was Double Dash on the GameCube, because, you know, it was had such a unique mechanic behind it. When you're looking at Wii and the a couple of times I've played eight, any of the DS versions of it, 
you know, there's nothing that really differentiated those from any other one outside of a couple, you know, gimmicky things like the hang gliding and all of that. So I'd be cool with it being Mario Kart 8 that was upported because it's a Mario Kart game that I can play I'm sure they'll add a couple of courses and tracks and things like that and you know some hidden things stuff to unlock but that's fine by me you know I'd be fine with it being a port of the Wii heck I'd like whatever they wanted to do with it because I can sit and just play Mario Kart either online or with my wife that's going to be fun and in HD and that I can carry with me yeah yeah it looks cool and then Splatoon might be the same thing that one might be an upported game or it could be Splatoon 2 I, it's impossible to tell from what they showed because they didn't really show a whole lot that's not in the original game. Um, Splatoon is a good game, by the way. You should try it eventually. Oh, I've heard wonderful things about it. It's just one I've not even had the opportunity to touch. Yeah, I like it a lot. My kids still play it a lot, even though I'm pretty much done with it. But it's a very approachable, competitive... It's a shooter, but you're not really trying to yeah. shoot people. You're just trying to cover the ground and paint. It's it's really a cool game. Um, yeah, it and, seems super awesome. I'd be interested to see what they do with Splatoon 2, whatever that looks like. Because yeah. if they took what they learned and they made it even more so, it, it could be a really good game. Other speculation stuff. I do all my games digitally, so I'm really wondering what they're going to do for like uh, some kind of storage on this. You know, yeah. it's I know, not going to thinking about that. It's not going to be like an SSD, like a giant removable drive. Um, it, it can't be an external USB hard drive, which is what they did for the Wii U, because this is a portable system, right? Yep. I'm I'm really hoping it's just an SD card. I, I hope so. I mean, Nintendo has been pretty good in the past about not doing proprietary BS, which is what, like, um, yeah, <laughs> it's the what Vita. Sony tends to do, right? The Vita, yeah. If you go look up, like, go ahead, just Google really quick while you're listening to us how mm-hmm. much it costs to buy a Vita memory card just to have internal storage on the device. It's insane because Sony makes their own proprietary stuff and it's annoying. And it's so much more expensive to it pay is. for that it's premium. Crazy. It's like it's like paying for Apple stuff, really. I mean, Apple gets a lot of, of flack for their proprietary systems and proprietary hardware. Sony should should get ripped for this one because you can get a much larger memory card for a third of the price. But you can't put it in the Vita. Yeah. And I mean, like I have, you know, a 500 gigabyte hard drive on my PlayStation 4. That thing's been full forever. Anytime I want to buy a game, I have to delete a game. Like 500 gigabytes is not much with current HD games. So they better give us a way to increase the internal storage of this thing at cheap rate. So SD card, SD card is pretty standard. Um, It's been out for a long time. Like you can buy them for cheap and they will just keep getting bigger in terms of capacity as time goes on i hope that's what they end up doing i do and i I can see when they update the hardware when they do the next you know the next run of them at the next holiday that they'll just have bigger hard drives in them bigger amounts of native bigger amounts of native storage yeah i can see that too um how do you feel about the fact they didn't show any touch screen i don't care i Honestly, I don't care at all. I use buttons because I'm 90 years old. I uh, I don't care about touchscreen gaming. It's, I'm kind of tired of it in a lot of ways because, yeah, you can do really cool things with it. I mean, I'm not denying that, but I bought the Vita with the under, without knowing that it had a touchscreen on it, that I was not intending to ever use it as a touchscreen. I barely use the touchscreen on it. I still navigate with buttons. It's just... I, when there are buttons, I tend to prefer to use those. It just feels more solid. I don't have to, you know, do it two or three times if I miss the screen or it doesn't register. That I don't care if this is touchscreen or not. I guess for me, what would make it useful as a touchscreen is if it were more of the you had apps that you want to do that you can use it as a tablet or at least you know a minimally functional tablet like uh just for web browsing and things like that if it's much better than what they've done in the past i could see using a touch screen for that but in terms of gaming and puzzle gaming and things like that not the kind of games i play not something i'm it's not a system seller either way for me if it doesn't have touch screens i'm like all right it doesn't have touch screen um maybe if it doesn't that'll bring the price down that's a that's something that's important to me is the price point. So if that brings it down 50 bucks a console, then yeah, you know, no touchscreen. 
that's kind of how I feel too. I like touch screen games, but I like them on my phone or my iPad. Yeah. Um, when there's buttons, I want to use buttons, right? Like the 3DS, I play my 3DS all the time, but I anytime I have to actually like use the touch screen on the 3DS, I kind of internally sigh and I'm like, okay, fine. Um, I crinkle my nose. Like I, I would much I rather that, just use I'm the like, buttons. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's like if your device isn't built entirely for touch screen and you have buttons, then the touch screen always feels like a gimmick or a second thought yep. or like you have to take your hands off the button. So it's an inconvenience, right? So I love touch screen gaming on my phone for games that are made for the phone for the touch screen gaming, but yep. I don't need it at all. Like if they left it off of the switch, I'd be totally fine. Like, just like yep. you said, it's like, okay, whatever. Like maybe the price will come down. Great. Um, yeah. Uh, my main concern is, is the battery life. I would really like them to come out and tell us a little bit more about the battery life because you have a big tablet playing like really good console quality games. Mm -hmm. I wonder how long the battery will last. Plus the fact that each of those individual controllers has to be getting power from somewhere. Like you have a bunch of different things. I'm assuming they're pulling from the console itself. I'm whenever they're charging, when you plug it in, I'm assuming they're just, you know, pulling from the, the main battery probably i would think so if you have them attached yeah yeah but my my concern with this is not how long the battery lasts because i'm assuming like the 3ds it's going to be anywhere between three and five hours i figure that's a pretty standard battery life for a console that for any kind of gaming console that's going to have any kind of hd graphics i mean it is go- the higher resolution screen is going to pull more power and you're going to have to have a huge battery to get a lot more than that in terms of with pure gaming what concerns me about it is portable gaming for people who are traveling like you said that there needs to be a charger that's not the dock because if you're taking it with you and you're on a plane you're on a business trip you're not going to pack the dock with you you're bringing the console and you're bringing the screen and you're bringing the joy cons but if you can't do it with a cord or something like that 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 you know even being able to use a micro usb or something with it if you can't do that then there's going to be an issue because it severely limits the usability that even if you only get three hours of battery, if you can just plug in a cord, you're going to be okay. But if you have to carry that dock with you, I think that's going to knock people out. I'm I'm pretty sure they have to include some other charger in the box. Like it's, it's got to so. come with it. it. It would only make sense. If not, it feels like a huge oversight. I think they just didn't want to show that in the first marketing video. Like all of these little details that they wouldn't want to show off in the first thing because they just want you to get the core yeah. concept. You know, I don't see any way that that doesn't come in the package. I don't think it's going to. Because look, I've looked at the 3DS, the new 3DS. It doesn't come with a charger. The only reason they did that was because the new 3DSs are appealing to people who already have 3DSs, and they were assuming uh, people okay. have chargers from one of the past like three models they released because they all have the same charger, right? It's yeah. like they were trying to save money for people who wanted to upgrade the console who already have a console. So that's kind of a one-off weird thing they did. I don't see them doing that for a brand new system. I hope not. Yeah. Unless it uses the same charger. At the same time, if it does that, if it lets me use my 3DS and 2DS charger, cool. I'm good with that. Yeah, that would work. That'd be fine. In terms of like what we saw, I thought it was really interesting that there were no kids in the video. They're targeting... Not one. No, they're targeting adults, which is... It, it kind of makes sense. Like the people who are going to watch an announcement video and get excited are us, right? Yep. My my kids who play Nintendo consoles almost every day, they don't care. Like a marketing <laughs> video no. announcing a new console means nothing to them until they can touch it and like, you know, experience it in real life, whether that's in the store or at home after I buy one. That's when they care. Like once it's out and people have it and kids hear about it, that's when the kids are going to get excited. They're not going to get excited for this like hype video like we are. So I think that they probably did the right thing there, just including people our age roughly. Yep. And I think that we're the ones with money. We're the target demographic for, you know, every kind of media. We are the ones who grew up with Nintendo. This is the kind of, we're the exact people that they want to buy this console. They're not targeting 17 year olds. They're the PS4 generation. They're the Xbox One people. They're the ones who are wanting to play Call of Duty. And those of you who are listening, who are within that, who are not, then I'm terribly sorry for stereotyping you. (laughs) Um, But the, uh, but, 
but for the most part, though, that's the demographic that buys those consoles are teens and college students. We're the people who buy Nintendo consoles. People who are mid-30s, 40s now, grew up with Nintendo, have kids, sharing that with your kids. And, I mean, this video has made my wife excited. She watched it with me initially, the very first viewing, and she was like, that looks really cool. That one, you know, that one's interesting, where she doesn't care about that kind of thing. She's like your kids. Whenever there's announcement like that for a new console, she's like, mm, whatever, uh, because that's not her thing. And this one got her interested. So I think they know what they're doing with the marketing. I mean, of course, they know what they're doing with the marketing. They're Nintendo. But I mean, they're it's very purposeful in what they're doing and how they're presenting it. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like late 20s into 30s was kind of everybody in that video. Um, yep. Like my wife also got excited okay. for this. She saw it and she said, that's really cool. That would be fun. <laughs> and that was yeah. kind of it. But she still thought it was cool. So the video worked, you know, like she sees me play consoles. She doesn't play a whole lot of video games ever. Sometimes she does, but not very much. Um, but yeah, it was just interesting to see it appeal to her. And like, that's another thing. I had a bunch of friends reach out after this video went live that day. Friends that yeah. they play PC games and they play some core games that they've played kind of forever, um, but uh -huh. they don't own any current consoles, right? These are the people who had maybe Xbox 360s or PS3s in college when I did, but then after we graduated and got into the workforce, these are the people who haven't ever bought a console again. They don't game as much as I do. Mm, I had a yeah. ton of these people reach out and go, that looks really cool. Like, I'm thinking about buying one. What should I know? You know, because they know that I play games. So it's amazing yeah. how many people came out of the woodwork and they were just like, that looks sweet. And I'm like, oh, really? You're actually thinking about buying a console for the first time in years. I thought that was fascinating. And I think that's great. I mean, that that may be what they're going for. Those people who were interested in gaming, but not hardcore gamers. And that's kind of Nintendo's thing. Those are the people who bought the Wii. That's why it was so successful is it wasn't targeted at the you know the ps3 xbox 360 generation yeah um okay so another thing about the controllers that i had a note here did you notice the d-pad on those little joy cons no. um mm -mm, not really i didn't even that never even no it is weird it's like <laughs> so the d-pad on the pro controller looked normal but the d-pad on the joy cons was like separate buttons almost like you remember how the c buttons used to be on the n64 yeah where the was that the D-pad? Yeah, they had or a D-pad that buttons? was like that. And I'm sure that the reason they did it was because of that mode where you can take them both off and hand one mini controller to each person. Yeah. Because then you have individual buttons for that person. That makes sense. Because that's just, all I ever thought it was. It was weird. You should take another look at it after we're done. Like, I don't see myself using that D-pad. But then again, how often do you actually use a D-pad when you're gaming? You just use the joystick. Like, I do anyway. Yeah. That's exactly what it is, because I'm looking at it right now, and it's, you know, X, B, Y, A on the uh, on the right one, and then on the left one, it is a D-pad that turns into the same buttons. It's got that same configuration. You're exactly right. That yeah. is weird. I just thought it was weird. I wanted to flag it because I thought it was strange, but the more I thought about it, the more I went, yeah, I guess we don't really use D-pads a whole lot anymore, unless you're into, like, the fighting game scene, but that's, that's a whole different thing. Um, and that's not on a Nintendo console. You're playing Smash if you're doing it and you're not using the D-pad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the other thing, the last piece of speculation that I wanted to do here was I'm wondering if the dock and the handheld are going to be sold separately. Probably not on day one, but I wonder. I wouldn't if say day one. No, but I wonder if they're going to do that because I see two different use cases that might happen and both of them could happen in my house, right? Um, the yep. first use case is that I buy a Nintendo Switch. Like, I'm not buying my kids a day one console, right? They they, no. they don't care enough. <laughs> no. They're not older, old enough. I don't want to spend that kind of money. But I'm going to buy one and um, at some point because I buy every Nintendo console. I don't know when I'm going to buy it, but at some point. And I'll have a dock on my main TV, right? When I have that dock on my main TV, like, if I end up eventually buying a Switch for both of my kids, do I yeah. need to buy another dock or can they just use that one like can they just come plug in their console to that you know what i mean like having uh -huh. three different docks if all three of us owned the console which 
granted, that's years and years off, but it's something that might happen eventually. Like, could you just buy mm-hmm. the, the handheld part, the main console separately for cheaper? You know, actually, I didn't think about that. This is something that may be able to help with the price. And this is something I really hope the Nintendo does, because it would make me be way more likely to buy it on day one if I could get a one ninety nine version of it with just the handheld and the Joy-Cons, because that's primarily how I'm going to be playing it. But... If I could then buy, if they had a two ninety nine version of it that came with the dock as well, that seems like a really good, you know, release strategy because it would see if Jennifer and I would be playing Mario Kart, if it would be worth the extra money down the road to get the dock to hook up to the TV. If not, it's something that we could play every now and then, sit on the couch, you know, laugh and play, play Mario Kart together on a split screen and, you know, go about our day without having that extra hundred dollars in investment. Because that's really important to me is staying on budget and making sure that, you know, tech tech purchases aren't, you know, frivolous. And I can see them doing it eventually. I hope they do. So we have choices. Um, I don't see that being day one. I see day one. They want everyone to have the same package right out of the box. Yeah, Um, I could totally see it. The other use case that I was thinking of is, and this one's more likely to happen sooner for me. I buy a Nintendo Switch and I use it for a while and I like it. But now I also want a dock for my upstairs TV. Can I just buy the dock on its own without the handheld? It's not something I need day one. It's not something I think they would do on day one, but... If you have a couple different TVs around your house and you know that the thing powering all the console, like the guts of it, are in your hand, why wouldn't you be able to just buy docks for different TVs around your house? Yeah, because that's kind of like the PlayStation TV that you have upstairs where you can just go do it and not worry about the main TV. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of Nintendo consoles in general, nostalgia type of thing, um, this is a unique launch because it's not a console, a home console or a handheld. It's both. But I was just wondering, like, how do you feel in terms of excitement compared to how you felt about past Nintendo consoles? Oh, man, it feels like I'm dead inside compared to old consoles. <laughs> and it's I'm, I love the 64. Like, I have never been more excited for anything than I was for the Nintendo 64. I mean, I followed it with every gaming magazine that I could from when it was announced and people were calling it the uh, the Dolphin, I believe. And they were it was the Dolphin first and then it was the Ultra 64. And then they decided on the, you know, the international same naming convention as Nintendo. 64 I was so excited for this like that was the one that I cared the most about and then weirdly the next one was the virtual boy and this is where everybody listening right now is gonna be like are you serious oh dude what is wrong with you and I was the 64 and the virtual boy were the ones I was the most excited for and now I'm just kind of like yep here's a console it's going to come out. I may buy it on day one. If not, I'll, you know, I may ask for it for Christmas next year, that kind of thing. Or I might ask for it for Christmas this year and just have money in my pocket waiting. <laughs> and uh, that's, I don't know. I've been way more excited where this one, I'm, like I said, I feel like I compared to the, how I was before about the 64 and the Virtual Boy, I feel kind of like a robot, kind of dead inside. Yeah, part of that comes from you were a kid. And hype is a yep. lot easier to have when you're a kid. I feel the same way. I feel yeah. like um, my hype levels for like the Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64 were the highest that I've ever been. Probably the Super Nintendo yeah. was the most because I was even younger then. And getting that Super Nintendo was amazing. But the N64 was a huge surprise too when I got that. Th- those are like child levels of excitement that as an adult, yeah. you can't really reach often ever again. But I do feel like this is the most I've been excited for a console as an adult. And that, that makes it, sense. That includes like the 360, the PS3, the PS4, Xbox One, like all of the consoles that have come out since I've been an adult. This one I'm the most excited about because I see this one fitting into my life a lot better than any of those. Like I said, you know, PS4 came out and I was like, that's cool. I'll get that sometime. And I waited for a good Black Friday bundle before I got it. Yep. PS3, I didn't buy that until it was super cheap at the end of its lifespan. Like I bought that. But it's very recently in terms of when it came out and how long it's been out, right? Same here. Um, this one, I could see myself getting it on day one. If not, I, I will get it. It won't take very long, right? Like, I'm not going to wait super long to pick this console up. And that kind of ties into 
like the pricing and like how you feel about release day. Mm-hmm. I think these two go hand in hand, right? Because if it were $2, both of us are going to get it on release day. But oh yeah. What does it take in terms of like pricing, do you think, to get you to buy it on day 1? If it were day 1, I could I could see myself buying it at 150. 150 would be a day 1 pri- uh a day 1 purchase and I wouldn't think twice about it. I'd be like, "Yep, 150, I can, you know, I can spare that with pretty much anything in our budget. Let's do that." And even 199 would be more difficult because of taxes and things like that getting on it. It would raise the price even more where I'm like, I can't really do it on day one, but I'll get it soon. If it's $300, honestly, if it's $299, it's going to be in, you know, quarter three, quarter four purchase, if then. Black yeah. Friday deals kind of thing, like you said. Um, For me, I don't know. I'll see how I feel when we're closer to day one in terms of price, but... I guess the thoughts that I have about price are more about Nintendo as a company and less about me personally. Because for me, when I decide to pull the trigger on a console, it's like in the moment how my money is doing, right? Like if I have the money at the time, then I'm like, yeah, let's grab it. If not, it's like, oh, I can wait. Um, I can't really plan. Like this isn't out until March of next year, right? Like that's still, what, five months away? Six months almost? Um, Yeah. That's too far ahead to plan in terms of finances. But yeah. As far as the pricing, I think if Nintendo wants to come back and actually compete in the console market again, they need this thing to be $250 or less out of the Or less, yep. Because you can buy a PlayStation 4 bundle right now, a good one, for like $275-ish. Okay, yeah. And you can go and buy the PlayStation 4 Pro. By the time this is out, that'll be out. That one's not that much more. I want to say, is that one like three fifty or three ninety nine? I don't know. Something. I think in there. it was three ninety nine, but which yeah. is just put it puts it completely out of the realm of possibility for me. I will not pay that for a console. I paid release date price for the Xbox three sixty, <laughs> and it's kind of like we had talked about in uh, an episode a while back. I think it was the MMO episode that you get burned once by paying that much for something and you don't do it again, I feel like I got burned by getting a release 360, and so I will not pay over $200 for release anymore. And I will, but I'm not going to pay tons and tons, right? Like $400 is too much. But yep. um, I see, I think if they really want to get back into the market and compete long term and get a good user base, I think they need to have it in like the 250 price point. Um, in terms of what I actually think that they are going to do based on what they've done in the past, it might be two ninety nine. I see that as being kind of like that I, I see them aiming for that. I see two ninety nine a very real possibility. If it's over three hundred dollars, I don't know what they're doing to themselves in terms of the market because yeah. just look at how much Xbox One and PlayStation Four bundles are now and how much they're gonna be by mm-hmm. the time this comes out in five months. Like if you're making it more than those bundles, you are doing something wrong because your console, we don't know the specs, but it looks like it's not going to be as powerful, right? I know it's portable and it has and other things okay. about it. And that's okay. Yeah. But, yeah, but as it, soon as you cost more, you are offering direct comparisons to those. So, like, I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to watch the price point, And I, I hope it's low enough that they can get a huge install base for this thing. And it can really mm-hmm. take off. And I think that they're aware of their position now. I th- I feel like Nintendo, with everything that we've seen lately, is very aware of how they're perceived and how they have what they have to do to compete. That they're no longer the market leader, and that they're going to adjust to that. That people aren't going to pay after the Wii U three hundred dollars or four hundred dollars out of the box for a Nintendo console just because it's Nintendo. Yeah, that may have happened in the 90s, but not for a long time. Not yeah. now. Yeah. Yep. Oh, well, it'll be interesting to keep an eye on. We will talk about this more in Weekly Geekeries as we get closer. And we'll definitely talk about it whenever it launches in March, even though we don't have a date yet. Um, but with yep. that, we should probably get on to our, ooh, our geeky offer of the week. We still have the Gamefly thing set up. If you guys want like a free month of Gamefly game rentals just sent to you and you get to mail them back, it's really nice, really easy service to use. You can go to GameflyOffer.com slash geek. 
and you can get like a one month free trial. We have that set up for you. Besides that, Weekly yep, Geekery. Do. Yeah, go for it. Um, Weekly Geekery, if you don't know, Weekly Geekery is where we share what we've been geeking out about this week. What do you got this week? Oh, wait, before uh, that, I was on the comic box again. <laughs> I was, Rob had me back to talk about Luke Cage now that we had both seen all of it. So I did that one preview episode with him where I learned about the history of Luke Cage. And then he had me yeah. back last week to talk all about Luke Cage. So if you haven't subscribed to that or you haven't checked his feed lately, go listen to that episode. It turned out really good. Okay, sorry. What do you have for <laughs> stuff? Um, this week, we actually had a pajama party with a couple of our friends to watch the Hamilton documentary on P. BS. Have you been able to watch it yet? Not yet. I was out of town for the weekend, but I really want to watch it. Okay. It's so good. It's streaming on Facebook right now. Uh, and uh, Lynn posted about it not uh, being online to stream forever. So get on it, you guys. Um, I'll include a link in the show notes for you to find it where it is to stream. Um, it's great. It's about an hour and a half of documentary about the entire production, uh, including pre-production. Like They've been working on this since before Hamilton went live, before it was actually on stage. So so, you know, you see Lin-Manuel going into his new apartment and tying it into lyrics and writing lyrics. You see things like Hamilton's uh, The Table. You see the room where it happens. You see where the cabinet was uh, meeting. You see, you know, Lin-Manuel writing in these bedrooms where they were staying. Like, it's just fantastic. You hear, you see letters that... They, that Aaron Burr and, and Alexander Hamilton were writing each other, the uh, Your Obedient Servant, A. Burr, all of that. And Hamilton sounds exactly like an internet troll. Like, he is such a jerk. Like, I've never read the personal correspondence before, but man, you need to watch this just to get to the end where Lin Manuel and Leslie Odom are reading these letters back and forth to each other. It is just delightful, and uh, so y'all need to y'all definitely need to go watch this documentary. It is great, especially if you have listened to Hamilton like we you know like we've been you know harping on for the last year. Um, and if you haven't listened to Hamilton yet, go listen to. Hamilton, what are you waiting for? What do you stall for? Um, <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> I did. Um, I'm sorry. That won't make any sense to you because you haven't listened to Hamilton yet. But and, you should. Uh, but you should. So also, I've been getting back into running. I've been really geeking out about running this week because I have uh, finally gotten the energy. I got the the mindset back that I needed to do it. So I've been working on a run streak. Uh, as we record this, today will be day six of it, of running every day. And I've been podcasting about it on the Health Hacks podcast every single day. And so I've been really geeking out about running and running shoes. Like, I'm going nuts looking at Ultras and Asics and Newtons and I even got out my old Brooks and put new 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 uh, insoles in them. You can see I'm getting excited because I'm stuttering. And so I just getting back into this and reading and surrounding myself with running and reading articles about it has made me so excited. So the, I've got a thread about it on the subreddit as well. So y'all need to come in, join me and start running with me. I I want to I want to run with you guys. I want to geek out about running with other people instead of just sitting in, you know, in this office chair rocking back and forth staring at brooks glycerin shoes wow so yeah nice running. um yep. <laughs> i i I'm finished, crazy it's all good um i finished the ahsoka book that i was reading last week the new star wars yeah one. um it, i liked it just for the context that it gives to ahsoka and the rebellion and it kind of it, it felt like an episode of Clone Wars or Rebels, but taking place makes right sense. between the two of those series, which makes sense because Ahsoka is a character in both of those series and she's not really anywhere else in the Star Wars universe. So yep. this felt like um, like an extended story arc from Clone Wars or from Rebels, right? But it's all about Ahsoka. Yeah. And it didn't really have the epic feel of a novel. It felt more like the novelization of of a TV series arc. So it wasn't like, okay. I didn't think it was amazing, but I'm really glad that I read it because I liked getting the context and learning about it. Does that make sense? It does, because I've had a lot of books like that, especially Star Wars books that weren't great on their own, but were great based on what they let me know about. Yes, exactly. So that's how I felt about Ahsoka. And then I finished that and I moved on to Paper and Fire, which is the second yep. one from Ink and Bone, which I was talking about the other week. Um, That's the great library series where the Library of Alexandria never burned down. And Paper and Fire 
Fire was excellent, just as good as the first one. And now I want the third okay, one, good. but it's not out yet. So <laughs> now I'm waiting. Now I have to wait for the next real release to come out, and I have no idea when it will be, and that's kind of sad for me. But I am going to once again recommend ink and bone because it's the first one in the series and then if you like that pick up paper and fire because i read it and i like that one a lot have you oh, read and it I would also, you're going to right no i haven't read it yet but i'm going to okay. um that also reminded me about something that for you uh listeners out there as well while we're talking about books um if you read the lightbringer series by the blinding knife the broken eye the black prism by brent brent weeks the fourth book in the series comes out tomorrow on oh, october 25th wait yeah, what it comes out to- yeah so uh, this has gone under the radar How for that everybody me? i'm googling it like, right now. yeah yeah it's on amazon it's gonna be 14.99 on kindle um But you can, you know, you can buy it however you want to. I don't care how you do it. But I wanted to let you guys know, because I've had a couple of conversations already about this book, and the series is just fantastic. Like Everybody I know who's read this series, kind of like Paper and Fire and Ink and Bone, that it's just fantastic. And, you know, everyone who reads it loves it. Uh, That's the way the Lightbringer books are. And the fourth book, it was supposed to be a trilogy, but then he got to the point where it's like, oh, yeah, this isn't going to be a trilogy. I think there are going to be at least five books. Book four comes out as we're recording this tomorrow by the time you're listening to it it's already out so if you didn't know that book four of the lightbringer series by brent weeks is out or close to being out or whatever if you didn't know book four existed it's out right now so uh go buy it because you know you love the series like i do i will have already bought it by that point I just bought it um, while you were talking. <laughs> it's like me and pre-ordering Cosmic Star Heroin. It's like you get so excited about something. It's like, I'm doing it while we're recording right now. And it yep. is. It's it's super good series. So y'all should definitely go read it, too. I like that series a lot. The only other thing I really did this week, like I said, I was out of town for part of it. Um, I played the Pokemon Sun and Moon demo. Okay. Which I don't know. I haven't played it yet. You can get it. It's out on whatever, 2DS, 3DS. Yeah. Um, I like some of the new things that they're doing. I mean, I kind of knew I was going to pick up Pokemon anyway because I liked the last one when they're finally moving to 3D, and this one is even more Mm so 3D. But they're doing other interesting things. Like, there aren't really gyms in it. There are, like, challenges instead. And there are... Okay. um, Instead of gym leaders, you have totem Pokemon, which are like a souped up version of a Pokemon that you fight against them and they can summon in other helper Pokemon. So it becomes this like one versus two, which is an interesting thing we've never Hmm. really done before. And then some of the other cool stuff, like they're taking HMs out of the game, which if you've never, never played Pokemon, HMs are like moves you have to teach your Pokemon and then you have to keep a Pokemon with that move in your team so that you can use it on the environment. So the one that's usually first is cut. So there might be like tall grass or a tree in your way. And to get through it, you have to have a Pokemon in your party with the move cut. But it it ends up like diluting your Pokemon party because you have mm-hmm. to have all of these HMs equipped. So what most people do, but what I always did, was you pick one Pokemon that's able to learn all of them and then you just never use them in battle, and they're only there as like a utility Pokemon to use all these moves. Uh-huh. Um, Pokemon Sun and Move gets uh, Sun and Moon gets rid of that. There are no more HMs. You just Yay. summon a companion Pokemon from wherever, like you know the either whatever, and they just show up <clears throat> and they do it for you. So I like that a lot. And then besides that, that's it, a good idea. It was just a cool setting. There were cool new Pokemon. I mean, it's Pokemon, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I mean. Are there additional uh, evolutions in this one that I've read about? Like, I haven't paid a lot of attention to it, but are there, like, or are those the totem Pokemon that, like, with the, uh, with the Doug Trio, with the, uh, like, wavy blonde hair? Oh, so there are variants on existing Pokemon, which they've never done before. Um, And it's basically, like, the region is called... Aloha or Aloan, something like that. And it's like an Aloan okay. variation on existing Pokemon. So oh, the thing you saw, okay. it was a Doug Trio and it still is a Doug Trio, but it has like long blonde hair for some reason. They had a bunch of examples <laughs> yeah. of that though. There's like, um, what is it? The executor, uh, with, executor uh, with gigantic like a uh, yeah. giraffe neck and palm tree thing. Yep. And they have new things. They have Z moves, which is like, you know, they added mega evolution before and now they're adding Z yeah. moves instead. There's just 
there's a bunch of little tweaks, but it's still it's yeah. mostly Pokemon, and I like Pokemon, so. True. I don't think I'm going to get it on release day. I actually canceled my pre-order for it, but I think I'm going to end up picking it up later and playing through. Kind of like I did with Omega Ruby. If it were coming out earlier in November, I'd grab it right away, but it's coming out really close to the new release date for Final Fantasy 15, so now I don't know yep. about it anymore. I'll see when it comes out, because I'm not going to buy physical cartridge anyway, so I don't need to pre-order it. Right. I just I'll make my decision the day that it's out and get it digitally one way or another. And so you mentioned Final Fantasy 15 and that's something else that I'm waiting on. I don't think I'm going to buy a PS4 for Final Fantasy 15 like I thought. I may not be getting a PS4 like I was planning on for Final Fantasy 15 release. I was going to either ask for the money for that for Christmas and get it then or, you know, buy it and then reimburse myself at Christmas and see if people would that just tell everybody, please just donate toward Final Fantasy 15 and PS4, but since they've announced that Square Enix is going to be a partner on the Switch, I'm waiting. I don't think it's going to be a release thing by any means, but it, since they've announced them, I'm assuming that at some point we're going to get that in Kingdom Hearts 3 on the Switch since they've announced that already, and I'm kind of holding out hope for that instead of buying an all-new console just for those that one game that's out. I think you are making very big assumptions, and I think you're much more likely to see a game like Dragon Quest XI or something on the Switch, right. and much less likely to see the next main Final Fantasy. But you can wait and find out. I'm sure you'll find out soon, you know? As yeah, the, we'll know soon-ish, yeah. Yeah, soon-ish. I am, I am not waiting for Final Fantasy XV. That one has been ordered on PlayStation 4 for a long time. I'm playing it the day it comes out, and we will cover it for sure. Oh, yeah. We yeah. may need to figure out how you do PlayStation 4 streaming so that I can watch you play it. Maybe. Maybe. We could take a look at it. That'd be cool. fun. Um, I think that's about it for this week. You can write to us with comments, suggestions, or feedback. Our email address is geek 2 at gmail.com or reach us on Twitter at geek 2 geekcast And we have our longer discussion threads on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash geek 2 geekcast And don't forget, we're still asking for question and answer. Ugh, just questions. We will provide the answers. <laughs> I did this last week, too. Um, you did. Uh, you can answer them if you want, but we'll still answer them. Yeah, we're doing a Ask Me Anything style podcast coming up sometime in november probably around thanksgiving so we can record early and then take a week off in there so if you mm -hmm. have any questions for us that are related to anything we've talked about or completely unrelated to everything that we've ever talked about now is the time to ask them um you can shoot it to us on twitter but that subreddit is probably a better place because we're kind of gathering them all there and we've got a thread up already. We've had some wonderful questions. And uh, my favorite ones have been the ones actually about our personal life, where it's just like, hey, what's this going on? And I'm like, oh, yeah, y'all care about me like I care about you. <laughs> so, so we'll keep gathering those if you guys send them our way. Oh, yep, absolutely. And, you know, if you want to shoot us an email with those, do whatever you want to do. Um, and if you want to get email updates from us about any of the podcasts on our network, sign up at geek 2 geekcastcom and tell us which shows you want updates about. I blog almost daily at agreenmushroom.com, and you can find me at GRN Mushroom. That's Green Mushroom without the E's on Twitter. And I'm on Twitter as at Professor Beege, and I host the Geek Fitness Health Hacks podcast, which is at Geek Fitness Cast on Twitter and lives at geekfitness.net. We've been Void and Beege with your Geek to Geek podcast. That'll do it for this week. See you next week, geeks. Bye, geeks. Don't switch podcasts. Huh? Huh?